I sang that song for more than 60 years, a song of praise to Joseph Smith, the prophet of the restoration and founder of the LDS Church, the church I served as a bishop for five years. I knew the church was true. I was a faithful Latter-day Saint. My life has been built on certain truths, but wishing doesn't change the truth. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. When I finally learned the truth about the real history and doctrines of Mormonism, I realized that I was following the gospel of Joseph Smith and not the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have come to learn that many others have made a similar journey out of the bondage of religion and into an authentic relationship with Jesus. And that's what this show is all about. Courageous people who want to share their story, hoping that you, the viewer, will discover the same new life in Jesus. So if you're a Latter-day Saint who is struggling with questions or seeking a genuine encounter with the Savior, we invite you to join us tonight. We have a joyful message that we want to share with you. Good evening and welcome to the Ex-Mormon Files here in the heart of Salt Lake City. I'm your host, Bishop Earl, and I appreciate you, or I'm happy that you're willing to spend a little of your evening with us tonight. I'm really thrilled and honored that, um, to introduce my guest tonight, uh, Doris Hansen from Polygamy, What Love Is This? Thank well, you for yeah. coming and sharing your story. Thank you, Earl, for we, inviting me. We actually had Doris scheduled uh, some time ago, and we're just really thrilled that she's here to share her story. And Now, what was interesting about Doris, too, is, uh, of course, you know her Dor uh, polygamy background, but both polygamy and the, and the mainstream LDS Church are uh, I come from the same foundation. So mm -hmm. tell us a little mm -hmm. bit about your bringing up as a... You were in the polygamy group and mm -hmm. born in, into the yeah. polygamy group, right? I, I was born uh, the first daughter, the third child of the second wife of, oh boy. <laughs> of my father. Yeah. Um, and uh, I don't remember a, a lot about growing up until I was about in the first grade. I don't remember a whole lot about that. I don't remember negative or positive things yeah. about my life growing up but uh, until about first grade and and then I just I don't remember a lot even then and until I was about in the third grade and then I start remembering things that were negative that mm. that were bad things that were going on in the home and in the family. And was that here in Salt Lake? I was well I was born and raised in the Kingston group, okay. Kingston polygamy group and they were new. They started in new then. They were start they started in 1935. Oh. And their home uh, base was bountiful. Oh. Uh, and they had people that had been converted to from Mormonism to the polygamy group that that were the beginnings of the the charter membership of the group and so there were people in Bountiful and Salt Lake and they they owned a coal mine down in Huntington and we lived there until I was in the first grade actually mm -hmm. um, I was born in Lehigh though I oh. wasn't born in Salt Lake wow. and I didn't live most of my life in Salt Lake I lived some of it but not all of it Wow. And um, we, uh, the the polygamy groups <clears throat> have almost all of them have the United Order concept, um, which has started with Joseph in Smith. Common, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and uh, everything about the polygamy groups, <clears throat> you can trail back to Joseph Smith. Sure. And that includes polygamy, of course, and the United Order. And with the United Order, they tell they take all your property, you, you give it, turn it into them. They call it turning it in, yeah. and then you get to use what they think you need. And that way, there's supposed to be enough for equalized for everybody. But of course, it doesn't work out that way. <laughs> but they get to tell in doing that. They get to tell the the families where they live and what they're supposed to do to work for the kingdom of God. And wow. my my father was uh, worked in the coal mine down in Huntington. Uh, for the first several years of um, of my life, of, of my lo knowledge of him, yeah. I should say, and then they assigned us to a farm which actually was belonged to his father, and it was in Caseville, and so we moved up there when I was in the third grade, and that's where I grew up was in Caseville on a farm. Now I, I remember hearing that you didn't even know who 
who this person was as your father right. until you were 10 or so? I would think I was around 10 years old and he would come and visit, but he still lived in Huntington in working in the coal mine and his first family while we, the second wife, my oh. mother and us, lived in Caseville on the farm. So he would come up, that was a long ways. They didn't have freeways in those no, days. It was true. a long drive. And so he would come up every other weekend but sometimes some, he didn't make it. Yeah. So I, when we saw him, he was a guest. He was a visitor. He wasn't anybody that I knew other than a family friend. Didn't know he was your, your I didn't dad. know he was my father, and most of us kids didn't, of course. And his mother and father owned the acreage we were on, and they lived in the house just down the field from us, and I never even knew they were my, my grandparents. Oh my goodness. And his sister, who was my aunt, I didn't know she was my aunt, lived across the street from them. So you're living right there with family and you don't even know their family. So this is a secrecy thing, isn't it? With a huge uh, secrecy. The, the first wife has all the rights, mm -hmm. is that right? And your, your mom was second wife, so. Right. The, the first wife and their family, they could call his father and mother, whom we lived right next door to. They, they could call him grandma and grandpa, but we had to call him by their first names. And they could call their father daddy, but we had to call him by his first name. And one, and he would come, like I say, every two weeks. Is he this would on come a, in, and he would only come on the weekend, too. It's kind of a conjugal visit? So is that it was what a conjugal it, visit. So to speak. So she would see him two to four days a month is the all that she would see him those first many, many years. And um, I was about 10, and my... I didn't suspect anything was wrong. I didn't know to suspect anything was wrong until one day my oldest brother, he knew, and he said... Oh. Uh, do you know who he is? Who his first name was Ivan. He says, "Do you know who he is? He, did you know he's your daddy?" This is amazing. And and you know what's really horrible about this, Earl, is that all those years my mother had told us that our father's name was Richard Hansen, that he was a truck driver, and that he only came home w once in a while, and he'd always come in the middle of the night, and he'd have to get up early the next morning to go on his next tr truck run, and that's why we never saw him. Oh my goodness. And she would see him, but we wouldn't. And I remember one time asking her, "Where? when was my daddy gonna come home and see us? And she said, oh, he was home last night, but he had to leave before you got up. And I, I remember feeling this horrible feeling inside that he didn't even care enough to meet his own kids and that we you could didn't meet even him. know him yeah and so when I found out that this other man who was a family visitor was really my father I was devastated I wouldn't believe it at first I just couldn't believe it at first and how could you trust your mother I guess in a way was that hard I mean had she been she was living this lie too. I guess she had to to do that, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. All all the women, all the mothers, all the plural wives had to live the lie and lie about who their who the father of their children were, yeah. and that was just part of the being part of the group. That was just part of being part of polygamy, uh, is lying about everything. And once they knew that I knew, then they started bringing me into those lies. And they would have family meetings where if somebody at school asks you this question, this is what you tell them. If they ask you this, this is what you tell them. Oh, they really so told they taught us how to lie to oh. protect the group. It started back with Joseph Smith, by the way. Yeah. All this same thing is what they did then lying about uh, the, their polygamy life. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, it is. Um, it, it was when I found out he was my father that things turned bad. Uh, and I mean bad because now they knew I knew yeah. and they could keep me under their thumb. And, that, and they use all kinds of things to do that too, don't they? They do. They did yeah. the fear. You yeah. know, I think the worst thing about, well, one of the worst things about growing up in a polygamy group is the fear and the guilt um, that they they just they just pile on us. They use fear and guilt to keep us in their bondage, to keep us obedient, uh, to keep us tied to the group, trapped in the group. And there's not only the 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 emotional, but I mean it's spiritual and physical and physical. all kinds of ways of, mm -hmm. of threatening. Physical right? and emotional fear, yeah. yeah. And yeah. telling you're going to go to hell if you mm -hmm. aren't living polygamy. If, and if you don't live polygamy, if you don't, and, and if you tell anybody, if anybody finds out what's going on in the group because of something you've said to an outsider, you have automatically lost your eternity. 
Oh my and, goodness. and so you had, that's why they had to drill it into you, what kinds of, of answers to give when people, if people began to question. Well, and when you say Joseph Smith began this, I, I mean, I've read section 132 as well, and, and he threatens Emma, mm -hmm. or God does, supposedly, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, threatens her with her life. With destruction. Yeah. If she doesn't do what, the, the polygamy thing. And they carry that through. And they, t that was the one of the, the things I remember hearing all the time. I mean, you will be destroyed if you don't do this. And then, yeah. and, and then once I knew, my mother started doing her lectures. Uh, and she would take me aside sometimes and she would preach polygamy to me and preach how I had to do that when I grew up and I had to be prepared and, and who be the right kind of a wife for the man who was going to marry me. Um, and when I was born, the leader of the group was there at my birth. They, the mother's don't have their babies in hospitals, and the leader of the group sometimes does the delivery, which is kind of creepy, but that's wow. what they do. He was there. I was her first girl, and he said, wow, you have a girl. You need to save her for me. And so all my life, at once I knew what polygamy was, my mother would go, he chose you. You're special. You get to marry, well, you know, and it just kind of creeped me out. <laughs> now, was she able to say all this to you with a straight face, kind of, if you know what I mean, uh, with a knowing all she knew about polygamy and being alone and not seeing a husband except a few times a month or so? She believed. Did she really believed it? <clears throat> she believed it. My mother ate it, slept it, drank it, mm. dreamt it, talked it. She lived it. Oh, she my. lived it. And she believed it. She believed that was her only way to heaven. Yeah. And I know many times I, I heard her crying over and over again and crying to God in prayer. And one time I snuck at her room and, and I found her diary. And I read some of her diary, and she kept huge diaries. And the, it was sad. It was so sad to see and read what she, and what hear she her going tears. Through, huh? But she believed that the worst pain that you suffered here for polygamy, the greater reward you would get in heaven. The more you suffer the here. The more you suffer. And so she, she almost lived like, bring it on. <laughs> <laughs> I want my reward in heaven. Huh? In oh fact, she even believed that God owed it to us. You know, and after I became oh, a yeah. Christian, You're bound and, you do. and read that, it just kind of made me shudder because I thought God owes nobody anything yeah. at all. Were you ever uh, propositioned or something at, at the earlier ages of 14, 15 or mm -hmm. anything? I never was. Yeah. I never was. Um, life was hard uh, up on the farm. We, we, my mother didn't, my mother was very, 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 very strict, more strict than my father was. But because wow. she was strict, she wanted him to be strict with us too. So he was strict with this family, but he wasn't with the first family as, as strict. Wow. And, and she believed in, in physical punishment. She believed in, if you do anything wrong, get them, you know, punish them then and whip your, whip the righteousness into us was kind wow. of her motto. So everything was just bad. It was just we were, we worked and worked and we never played and we never got to have fun. We never had any money. We got beat up every time we lo even looked funny in our face. And, and it was just a miserable life. And on top of that, we were extremely poor. And when you finally turn 18, you choose to leave. Was she pretty upset at this? Well, she didn't know I was leaving. I didn't tell anybody I was leaving. Oh. But life was just too bad. I, you know, I was so tired of being afraid. I lived in fear every day of my life, in fear of God, in fear of the group, in fear of my father, in fear of God, because God was so mean and hateful. Uh, that's all I taught. That's all I was taught anyway. Wow. That when I turned 18, I decided I was going to get out of there. And of course, there's a lot that, you know, that goes into yeah, making sure. that decision. But I did. When I turned 18, um, I ran away. I packed up my bag. I was living with the first wife and she was living in Salt Lake by then. Oh. And I was living with that family and had been for a year. And uh, I packed Just up the, my bags. Well, one little box actually. Yeah. And I ran away in the middle of the night. Wow. Yeah. And you, did you feel a freedom then? I think you mentioned before, though, that you carried this guilt into these, into I, your time after, or at least you carried that. I carried guilt even up to and after I became a Christian, 25 years later. Just couldn't shake it. Be, it huh? was something that is inbred into us. It is so pounded into us. Guilt is the, one of the toughest things to really get a good grip on 
with the power of God working in your life, you can. Mm -hmm. Without that, you can't. Well, you've been threatened that you're going to go to hell, lose your salvation, be a son of perdition. Mm -hmm. That's exactly. If you, don't, if you don't live polygamy and don't follow mm -hmm. and break away the way you did. And, and once I left, once I had made that break, like you say, I was gone. I was, there, no hope for me. My eternal life was forfeited. I was a son of perdition and that was it and there was nothing I could do about it. And you know, once you know that you're lost for eternity, what else matters? I yeah. mean, what else? You, you don't have any hope. You can do anything now and it, you're going to hell anyway. anyway. <laughs> and you lived that way for what, another 25 years 25 years, or so. years I lived that way. And you yeah. know what, while we were uh, growing up, like I said, we had been taught that, um, that we couldn't teach or talk to anybody outside of the group about our polygamy lifestyle and that carried on too as long wow. as the guilt into my afterlife so to speak to where I was afraid to tell anybody I was from a polygamy group all my life until I became a Christian I never told people that I was from a polygamy group oh my I goodness. kept it hidden well, what actually happens in your life after 25 years to to start making you think about uh, God again and maybe <laughs> thinking that he's He's not out to hate you and to punish you forever. Well, I, I did live my life rejecting God and running, kind of running from Him as it were, uh, because he, I thought He hated me and I did expect it. I wouldn't have been surprised to turn a corner any time, just see Him there with His nostrils flaring, ready to pounce on me, you know, and, and, and just send me right straight to hell at that time. Wow. Honestly, that is the way, the, what, what my mind said was. What a scary way to live. It was a sad, yeah. it was very sad. And my hopes and my dreams uh, really had, had crushed and things were bad and, and I just was emotionally kind of on a down, a down uh, spin. And I was working in an office where a client came in and left some books. And I didn't, by the way, I didn't want God, okay? I, and I wouldn't read religious books. Okay. But I can see God's hand in this now. And uh, he left some books there, and they were religious books. And one of them was Mormonism, Shadow, or Reality. I didn't know who Sandra Tanner was, by oh, the way. Okay. I didn't know. Yeah. Three audio tapes uh, by Walter Martin, a okay. very fiery Christian yeah. preacher. I'd never heard a Christian preacher before in no. my life. Yeah. And another book called Mormonism, Mama and Me by Thelma Gear. And they were all religious books talking about Mormonism. Well, I did, I'd have it up here with Joseph Smith. I didn't want to read any more about well, him. And you, you and know? you thought the LDS <laughs> church, too, was the apostate, right? Oh, I mean, yeah. they're the ones not practicing polygamy. They are the apostate. And, yeah. and if, with all my studies I've done since then, they really are. They are the apostates. I hate to say this, Earl, but you were in the apostate I, church, not me. <laughs> I didn't know that, but yeah, I knew that. That's I true. know that now. Yeah, you learn that later. But I, I was bored. I see God's hand in, in this, and I d was just getting bored. And I would pick up these bo this book especially, and I would thumb through it. And I didn't want to have much to do with God, you know, so I, I would just handle it very carefully. And one day, as I was reading in Mormonism, Mama and Me, I read three words that changed my life. No. Something that I had never heard before in my life, and it was that God loves me. And I just started to cry. I was 43 years old and I started to cry and I thought, God loves me. I'd never heard that before. A, a foreign concept. It was totally foreign. And I, and I remember saying to myself, I'm going to take this book home and read it from cover to cover because I've got to know more about this. And I did. And after I had finished reading that book, I knew beyond any shadow of any doubt, I never knew before that, that there's no way the Mormon church could be true. There's no way the polygamy groups could be true because I knew the foundation now. I knew the true foundation of Mormonism, of Joseph Smith, of polygamy, of their violence, of their deceit and their lies, the tricks, the blood atonement that Brigham Young did and the lies of Joseph Smith. And it was just all laid out there for me. And I, I, and I was just free. I wasn't saved yet. I wasn't a Christian yet. Yeah. But I was free now not to be afraid of God. And now I could s pick up the Bible and read it without fear. And did you start doing and that? And I did. Yeah. I started doing that. And reading a message that you'd never heard before as well. Isaiah 40, verse 8. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. Yeah. And now I knew that I could trust the Bible. And you know, that's all God wants us to do is trust Him and read His Word. Yeah. But in the very beginning, Satan comes and says, you can't trust what God says. No. And that's exactly what happens in Mormonism. Yeah. They teach you can't trust the Bible, which is mouthing the same thing the serpent said to Eve. 
Yeah. And then I and and then I get in the Bible and I read. You can trust the Bible. And I started to read it and the puzzle pieces started coming together and I knew. I mean, when you read and understand the Bible, you know it's true yeah. because it is supernaturally put together so so wonderfully. And precise. it becomes so clear. And so clear. So, yeah. Yeah. I remember reading it one time and I was at work and it was boring and I re and I was just eating it up, you know. I was just like a sponge, just taking all this in. And I stopped and I thought, What am I doing? I've never done this kind of thing before. <laughs> Here I am reading the Bible. I used to hate it, and I'm enjoying it, and I'm understanding it. <laughs> and that was the amazing thing. I loved oh. it, and I understood it. And you had such a heart for the polygamous women that are out there living under this bondage and uh, the threats and everything that you eventually well, get a TV show that... Uh, yeah, when I, when I found out that we're saved by grace, not by works, yeah. which is the, what, what, you know, the, the verse that clinched it for me, I thought, oh, they don't have to do this. The polygamists don't have to do this. I was so excited. You had to peel me off the ceiling. <laughs> and I wanted to tell them all, you don't have to do this. God doesn't require it. Wow. But nobody wanted to listen to me. Really? And God took years. He took years after I became a Christian. And, and I received Jesus in my heart and life. I received his forgiveness. I received his love. And I've been basking in it ever since, yeah. you know. And... I, I, I kind of sensed God would give me the opportunity at some time to have a ministry to the polygamists. Really? It didn't happen for many years, yeah. but now it's happened, and and He's just got me doing things I never would have ever dreamed that that He would have me be doing. But it's it's amazing and a privilege to work for God. Yeah. Well, what uh, what tell us just a little bit about how you came to the TV show. How that happened? Well, um, like I said, I had wanted to be able to tell the polygamists, and and I and I didn't know how to to be able to do it. I was, yeah. you know, lacking funds, of course, and um, and how to do it, really, and, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And really, how to start. And um, uh, th there was um, kind of a get together. It kind of started grassroots, where a few of us were getting together every week. To a couple that I know, a missionary couple that I know, knew my heart, and they yeah. wanted to see and just kind of delve into seeking God's will on this. Right. And they invited people to come, and more people came, and more people came. And one one time when we met. Um, and we got a bigger and bigger group each time. Uh, there was the the DVD uh, had come out, the DNA versus the Book of Mormon, oh, yeah. and that was a wonderful DVD. Yeah, yeah, I was so yeah. excited about that. We finally have some people who's doing some good stuff here, you know, that we can hand out to people. Well, well, um, there were some couple of the people that had been involved in that DVD from the church in Brigham City came to our meeting, our grassroots meeting, okay. and I met them during that time. And during our discussions, I guess they, well, we talked about, you know, my interest in starting out a, a ministry. And they asked me later if I would be interested in helping, in, in being involved in a DVD if they did one on polygamy. And if, if um, I could get people also that would be on it. Interviewed. And, that's Interviewed. The, and what was the name of that Lifting DVD? Lifting the Veil of Polygamy. It's a uh -huh. wonderful, wonderful, heart-touching yeah. story. Mm -hmm. uh, or several stories. Oh, it's, it is. It's, it's been very effective. The Maggerts and, and Mackerts and some others mm -hmm. that are on there. It's mm -hmm. just wonderful. Yeah. Did you yes. have good response from that DVD? A great response. Uh, we've that we launched the the ministry from when that DVD came out in 2007. We launched the ministry at that point. In well, May. And, the, and the TV people contacted you, did they? Uh, they and contacted me six months later in yeah. January of 2008. TV 20 management contacted me and said God told them they needed to get involved with the, the Shield and Refuge ministry and wow. they offered us a television show. And so you've been doing the show for six years? Since June 12th of 2008. Of eight, uh -huh. that six or eight? 2008. Oh, okay. Is when yeah, we six years. Show. Six, six years. years. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And is it, I'm sure you've had just wonderful response from it. I mean, I've heard from so many about what you do and, and now it's one of the few voices that are really out there. Well, it's it's out there as as a 
God is good. You know, I want the polygamist to know he doesn't hate us. He's not angry with us like I was taught growing up. Yeah. If you leave polygamy group, God isn't going to hate you. And I, I want them. I want them to know that. And I hope that as we work through the show and work through all the issues that surrounds uh, the polygamy culture, which yeah. is Mormonism, it is basic foundational oh, yeah. Mormonism. It's, it's what. And that's what we do on the show. We just work through all those foundational issues so that the people in polygamy groups can watch and say, "Wait a minute! I was taught this, but but it says that here." Yeah. And and maybe weigh the evidence and get in there and check it out for themselves. Yeah. And find out they don't have to live this life because it is a painful and torturous life sometimes. Well, you know, if Joseph Smith came back, he would live polygamy, wouldn't he? He would not be allowed in the Mormon church, but no. the polygamy groups would be vying for his membership, I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> and Brigham Young and all the rest of them. Oh. Well, Doris, you have such a wonderful story and, and just a wonderful ministry. I know you've touched a lot of hearts. A couple of minutes left. What would you say to your polygamist? viewers and certainly to the LDS mainstream people too. Well, I would say that the most important thing that anyone can ever do is know God. And Jesus told us that the way to know God is to know Him. And so to know God is to know Jesus. And Jesus is the Savior. And He came and He died on the cross. The Gospel is He died for our sins. Yeah. And he was buried and he was resurrected and he was seen by over 500 people. And if we rely upon Jesus as the Savior, not polygamy, not celestial marriage, not a church, not temple rituals, if we rely on Jesus Christ alone and trust him alone and trust his love, uh, we can toss everything else. We don't need polygamy. We don't need the uh -huh. United Order. We don't need polygamy groups and these living prophets that they all call themselves. And no, no priest. We don't need anything but Jesus. Did you ever hear? The, you obviously never heard that story in, in polygamy. Never, never. And you were it there till you were eighteen. Works related. To, no grace. I, I, the only thing I knew about grace is it was the name of a girl I knew. No grace was taught whatsoever. And now that I know what grace is, even as the Mormons teach grace, it is so wrong the yeah. way they teach it. They After don't all they the can right, do, yeah. yeah. They don't even have the right definition. So obviously you have a great burden lifted off your shoulders, and I think you've touched a lot of other people to hopefully have their, their burdens lifted and, and ha make them feel closer to God and, and know that He loves them. How I shocking so. it is to hear the words, those three words, oh, God loves God you. God loves you. You had never understood that. No, I, I, never, I never In fact, you, you I, thought you were going to hell. I thought I was going, and now the beauty of it is I know I'm going to heaven. Yeah. Not because of anything I've done, but because what if Jesus has done? Yeah. And we can know we're going to heaven before we die. Well, I, I think you've seen some uh, websites uh, on the screen here this evening, and certainly welcome to contact Doris at About Polygamy. That's your website, isn't it, Doris at About Polygamy? And the other websites that will, uh, if you have more questions, Doris has also been interviewed for Sacred Groves. Mm -hmm. you, they can, he, mm -hmm. they can go online to check that out. And also a Rebecca Kimball has done a couple of interviews with you. And to get more details, I know we've packed a lot of stuff in this uh, little half hour here today because of Doris's wonderful story. And I know we've kind of skimmed over yeah. a lot of it, but we appreciate you sharing your story. Thanks, Doris, uh -huh. for coming. Thank you. Thanks for joining us tonight. And we'll see you next week on, here on the Ex-Mormon Files. Good night. Mm -hmm.